Thank you everyone for being here on this cold, rainy, miserable Wednesday evening. But we have a big celebration. It's a birthday. He was famous not only as old Armenian poet, Amenayn Hayot Pamastet, but he called himself Amenayn Hayot Tamada, an old Armenian Tamada, and he loved the big party. So let's celebrate our great poet and let's start. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank the Armenian Institute for hosting such a wonderful event and for inviting me to perform this evening. Um, I'm going to be singing one of the most uh, famous Act One, Scene Two <coughs> choruses, Ambi Dagits, from Armen Tigranian's opera Anush, that was first performed in 1912 and is based on Tumanian's poem, written in 1892. The village girls are going to the springs to collect water for their village, and they're singing about the love theme of Amish. This arrangement has been composed by Artur Bobikian. And ladies and gentlemen, please, please, please do join us. We're going to be singing two verses. Yes. So if you know it, please, please join in. Stepanavan, 
they couldn't pay the fees there, so he never finished school there as well. And next, <coughs> he moved to uh, Tiflis, to Nersisian school. While he was in Java Lovely, a lovely thing in his life was his teacher's daughter, Regine. He fell in love with her when he was 12. Mm -hmm. I wrote his first poem, which we luckily heard. Hokus hador, sefis kador, dasis hamar, dumi hokar. Hekan daser, kana ekser. Gevin zar man ki bavar nyan por kentani mi patani, ser sertum, dase sertum. Uh, he started writing. He, by, by the time he was 17, he wrote one of his immortal works, Shun no Gadun, The Dog and the Cat, which we will hear later. Um, this is famous nurses and school in Tiflis where he studied, and um, a lot of our great studied there, like Hachadur Abovian and Demir Jan. Never finished his education here either. Couldn't pay the fees, was bored too good, too clever for school. He started working for various religious organizations in Tiflis. Meets a priest who has a beautiful niece called Mariam or Olga. Uh, and the uncle thinks, what a lovely man. He can marry my niece and then become priest himself. He was successful in introducing them and uh, young people <coughs> fell in love, but Tumanyan disappointed him, never became a priest. So, he married Olga Machkalan when he was 19 and she was 17. Um, she was a very loving wife to him. She tells her in her memories, first time he visited her, he brought her a really beautiful, fashionable pair of shoes. But after that was all books. For second date, he turned up with uh, Odyssey. For third date, with Iliad. And the fourth date, Khachatur Abovian's Vekast Army. So, um, she lived a very long life, 100 years. She outlived some of her children and him. And I was very devoted to him. And when I was reading her memoirs, it was very endearing that not only she loved him as her husband and partner, father of the children, she just treasured him as an amazing poet. When he was at home, he was just left alone to work and create poems. Uh, with Olga, they had 10 children. And I think everyone who was talking to me around those days was bored of me talking about his children, but this can be a topic for another event. All 10 of them were incredibly smart, wonderful, beautiful children. Four boys, six girls. All of them had higher education, became architects, geologists, painters, musicians. I think two, two of his daughters became the head of the Manor Museum in Yerevan. Just separately one of them. This is Artavas, or Artik, like he called, they called him, Artik Tumanyan. Artik was a promising painter, a very talented boy, who volunteered in 1914 to join the war. Like his dad, he was very active, very caring, setting up lots of medical points, food banks, supporting everyone after the genocide of orphans. In 1917, he ended up in Van, and in 1918, he was killed there. Mm. Most horrifically, Tumanyan learned about this from a newspaper. He was, he sat with his coffee in the morning, opened the paper to read his son was killed. It was a huge blow. He never recovered, and uh, I would think, had he been alive, it would be probably had a huge impact in Armenian culture. Other three sons followed the equally tragic fate. Other three sons were all killed by Stalin in 1937. Um, so Puroda saw the death of all of four of her sons. His, um, while they were all dead, while they were all alive, his Tiflis home was this beautiful corner. While it looks so wonderful, he's been <coughs> always poor. He never owned anything. He always rented. All this furniture were either presents or donations, or he found really cheaply some antique dealers. Or one thing he owned was uh, is this, this book, big bookcase in the corner. 
he called it Muromets because he bought it with the honorarium he bought for translating Russian legend of Villa Muromets. Um, <coughs> he had this sign in his room saying, please don't smoke and please uh, don't, don't ask for books from me. And of course everyone did. And then, of course everyone smoked. But it became an important, important cultural center for Armenian life. And, uh, at some point it became an official institution, Vernatun. I'm sure all of you heard about it. It means upper house. And it was only because they were gathering on the top floor of his Tiflis flat. Um, here are some of the members, which are some of our greats, Avetik Isahakyan and uh, Gilut Pashinchakyan, Hazaru Saran, who our great storyteller, who was a very good friend of Tumanian, and of course Komitas was a frequent guest there. They were very, they had a very, very supportive group. They would gather, they talk, they help each other, they listen to each other. And um, I think until now it was the one single most important cultural hub we've had. It later on became to uh, became a basis of other organizations to support artists and writers. <coughs> this is one of the parties at Vernadon. They were not always talking about literature, I'm sure. They were having lots of fun. He would famously borrow a lot of money for this party. He's never had any money, never had any cash. His uh, daughter Nevat remembers the story that Russian poet Valery Brusev, who was a big friend of Armenians, much loved, was coming to Tiflis. They had no money. Tumanian went home, borrowed lots of money, booked the best rooms in the most expensive hotel, organized a huge reception in his honor, and everyone thought it was fantastic. Then he was paying it off for next three years. Um, this is another side of Tumanian. He was very political. He always he was very caring for people. The first picture is, I don't know the exact date, this was a last minute find actually today, the color one. During 1905-07, there were lots of attempts from the Russian government to destabilize the situation in Caucasus. Much hasn't changed much, I have to say. And there were lots of clashes between Armenians and what they called them Caucasian Tatars or Azeris in Tiflis, in Baku, in Shushi, in Yerevan. Tumanyan left everything, got dressed in white outfits, he made fun of himself, found the white horse, held the white flag, traveled to the villages, urging everyone to stop saying, you're old brothers, you share the same land, stop killing each other do not shed your brother's uh, blood. And um, he was very, very much respected in Georgian and Kurdish and Turkish villages, so he did save lots of lives. However, Russian government classified him as a terrorist. And he was sent to prison twice in, uh, uh, between 1905 and 1911. He was freed, thank you, uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, Princess Marianne Tumanian, who is not a relative, but she's been always a big supporter and the rumored love interest of Tumanian, who had connections and money to get him out. Um, I read something interesting in his daughter's memoirs in Navarre, saying when they went to visit him once, they saw all the prisoners having their walk in um, Tiflis prison. Everyone's hands were cut except Manyan. He had he was so much respected even in the prison. They would let his um, let him be free. Um, so the first picture is when he was traveling in local villages with <coughs> leaders to try to stop bloodshed. Second one is a huge reception in Saint Petersburg because second time he was in prison there. When he came out, this is intellectual, Armenian and Russian intellectuals celebrating his freedom. Third one, although terrible quality, I'm sure you all recognize Andranik, who was his great friend. They loved each other, they apparently had lots of parties and drank together. There's a lovely story. Apparently he, Andranik loved the dog and the cat, Shumnogatun, famously. And uh, Tumanian told him once, saying the toast as a tamada, he said, 
Some time ago, there were two famous things in Armenian culture, Hrimian Hayrek and Shunnukatun. Hrimian Hayrek and don't give it a cat. And he said, now there are two famous things, you and Shunnukatun, Antronik. And Antronik said, never mind, he said, many, many years later, I won't be here, Hrimian Hayrek won't be here, you won't be here, Shunnukatun will be here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he, was, he appreciated a lot. Um, Moving on, an important, very, very moving chapter of his life. At this point, he was very unhealthy. In this picture, he's 50 years old. He looks so old. He looks so old. In 1915, he's been very unwell, so doctors advised him to go to outside of Tiflis to rest in fresh air. Uh, the family traveled outside Tiflis, and they heard about the very children. He paid them, he cut their hair, he read them fairy tales, he understood their mental health is as important as physical health. He played games with them. He had his own marketing campaign for them. He said whoever learns their lessons, he was teaching them, he said whoever does their lessons well, I'll take you home to meet Andranik. And the, for, the, for the kids, Andranik was such a big hero and they tried so hard to do that. Mm -hmm. And he remembers saying a lot of children started calling him Hayrik, father. Um, he would he spend his last money there because he was paying for everyone to be buried. There were so many people without families who were dead. So for months and months he would run around and that's where he earned his nickname, Amenai and Hayot Van Asteris, the old Armenian poet. Uh, this is, we know this story actually thanks to Vahan Totovens who turned up in H. Martin didn't, didn't last long, like Marty Rosayan, who turned up to help and fainted after half an hour there. Um, so the Catholicos then, who, Gevork, Gevork the Fifth, Gevork the Fifth was building new residency for him. And uh, some of the orphan children didn't have a place to stay, so Tumanian sends them to the new built apartment saying, don't stay there. And the Catholicus stops them. He says, do you know who I am? I'm the Catholicus of all Armenians. Children go back to Tumania saying, this is what he said. Well, he said, go back and tell them I'm the poet of all Armenians. <laughs> uh, wonderful story, but I find it so touching. He could have been in Tiflis. He could have been writing poems. He could have been living in safety and in comfort. He chose to be with the children. He remembers one of the children would follow him saying, would you sew me a red hat? This is how much they loved him. They thought he can just make hats for them. Mm -hmm. And I think it broke him. He never recovered. He was very unwell after this. And um, while he, he decided to go back and to devote himself to writing, he was invited to newly Soviet Armenia by Alexander Miasnikian. Then they suggested, say, why don't you come and be lead the fund for helping Armenians? <coughs> Initially he refused, but walking around the Erevan, seeing all the poverty and misery, he decided to stay. He traveled a lot. He traveled to police in 1921 and never got better after that. He self deteriorated. During last two, three years of his life, he wrote a lot. He wrote some of his famous portraits, which we will hear later on, which he wrote them while lying down because he was too weak to see. Then he died in 1923 in Moscow, in March. He wrote me to catch with Harry and Kuzenutak, Irene Hasaki Karkov Zalpatak, Miasin Bazmat, Michel Jan Kazmat, Kefein Anum, Yevurahanum, Merhaska Pape Numen Hairera, Yuri Terera. Menk Aruik Ujir Gerchuk Manukner, Yerek Tasanker. Nerant Arachin Habats Gangats, Zerkneres Honhar Sertneris Terats, Zil Ujer Zainov Nerant Aspasum, Tarin Gasum. Yerp Zvartazan Meyerk Nerets. Maral Tamaden Bechen Wolovets. Nrahet Vetsrin Lik Bajak Nere Bolor Metzera. Umezosh Netsin. Aprek Yerehek. Bats Mespesh Chaprek. 
ժամանակ անցավ նրանք են անցան զվարց երկերս վշտալի դարցան ու ես հիշեցի մեր օրը լալիս թե մեզ օրնելիս ինչու ասացին ապրեք երեխեք բայց մեզ պես չապրեք քաղաքություն ձեզ մեր անբախ պապեր ձեզ տանջող ցավը մեզ է մտածել այժմ տրկրության թեքեֆի ժամին մենք էլ օրնելիս մեր զավակներին ձեր խոսքն ենք ասում ապրեք երեխեք բայց մեզ պես չապրեք lived a pussycat who was very sleek and fat. As for his trade, warm things he made, hats and mittens for cats and kittens. One fine day, the furrier cat, whistling in his workshop, sat, when in came a dog out of the fog. He made a low bow and he yelped, hello. And after he'd yelped, he pulled out a pelt. And then he said to the cat, have a look at that. I've got no hat and winter's near. It's all too bad. I'll freeze, I fear. If it comes out nice, I'll pay any price. What do you say? Okay. How long will it take? Oh, less than a week. To oblige a friend, I'll be double quick. Sewing a hat isn't sewing a coat. Oh no, mere play. Come on Saturday. It won't be a hat, but a very peach. The envy I'll warrant of every and each. As for the money, that can wait. We'll talk it over. Never too late. Sewing a hat isn't sewing a coat. Goodbye, cat. And off the dog strode. On Saturday morning, the dog turned up, shaking and shivering like a wretched, wretched pup. Is it ready, my hat? <coughs> oh, no, they said. And where's the cat? Not at home yet. Before the door step, step on a mat, frozen Mr. Doggy sat. When down the street came Mr. Cat in a brand new lambskin. He saw the dog and he said, waiting for me, I bet. You'll be getting your hat, don't worry, and don't be in such a hurry. Though it isn't a coat, but a hat. It takes time, a job like that. I sprinkled the pelt before tea, and now I've got to cut it, you see. Too bad, said the dog, too bad that you haven't finished the hat. But maybe you'll tell me plain when I can see you again. I'm coming here not to chat, but to get my hat, Mr. Cat. Come on Wednesday, but please don't grumble before your pussy mumbles. So again, the unlucky dog came on Wednesday at three o'clock. Good day. Now it's ready, I hope. Day, lovely weather. Nope. <laughs> but here their voices rose in pitch. They told each other which is which, and finished with a noisy tussle involving claw and tooth and muscle. You're just a thief. You're just a crook. She's just a bitch, the wife you took. You big. You brat. You milksop, you. You filthy cat. I spit on you. Things went from bad to worse till it got to court, of course, where the judge and jury sat, who promptly ordered, summon both the dog and cat. The swindled cat and swindled, swindled dog both came to court at 10 o'clock. Who judged the case and where and how, I see no need to say. But ever since that famous row, the furrier ran away. He disappeared. And what is worse, took with him all his stock of furs. And since the cheeky furrier of all our cats is sire, to get their own back on the tribe is what all dogs desire. On seeing one, an honest pup starts growling at the, pet, at the cat, as if he wants to ask again, well, what about my hat? The cat just hisses in reply and spits from 
shame or fright. Just like the cat, whose story I made up my mind to write. Marian's literary heritage is poetry. He has some wonderful short stories, which luckily brought me in Gagik love, and we picked a snippet from his wonderful, it's a snapshot of a life in his beloved Lori. So Gagik will read a bit. This is, a, by the way, <coughs> illustration by Marty Rosarian, protecting Lori. I'm going to read a passage from a short story in which uh, Tumanyan talks about the arrival of a uh, railway in a rural area in North Armenia. A, a group of village elders are sitting discussing the pros and cons of this new mode of transport. Um, one of the railway construction workers approaches them with a request. He's from Sivas, Sepastia, in the Ottoman Empire. But because he's not from their village, he's considered, was referred to as Otaragan, a foreigner. <coughs> and I take up the story from uh, this place onward. Et vechi jamanak, yerkatuvo gtsivra ashkato Otaragan nedits mina zolitz dur sekavu motetsalmes. Bari rikunzes. As Subari Musta. In Zmicha Palure Harkavor, Dezanitz of Alur Kazahi, Dimets Otarakan Almekis. Horteratsi es Usta, Hartsret Zuhanes Bizen. Osman Levi Horitznem. Ohanes Biza, Halami Hartsret es Vorkarakitzna, Hantret Migurati. Kukaraki Anu Nincha Barekam, Berkin Hartsret Zuhanes Bizen. Savaz. Savaz, ye karats nero ukhor tavor kubnet zuhanes bizen. Incha sabuhanes biza. Savaz, pa kutun chivi. Zakt vinu tizaretsin mikani gurati. Enterit ester kani amsva jana para. Sharon akubi hartu borzo zuhanes bizen. Yere kamsva. Pa ho mi aberan kocheti naumenka. Hametek. Gari Bakhter, Nasti, Hatsbeden, Hatsan Mushara, Che, Shnurhakalen, Vrazen, Zezanit of Alur Kazahi, Michap Alur Tagana, Achchi Michap Alur Dursberek, Dernit Zent Vetsuhanes Vizen, Gluch Gluch Letzrek, Arserit Mine, Michap Alur Dursberets, Uzet Datarki Mecha Basna Torchara, In charge. Atza, der Atza to prakit meche. Che, arach mi gin ni manak. Der Atza, heto gimanas. Te voltangeli, dar takel hechta. Usten is to praga batsara, de imi inchtam hartsvet usten, so tits drama anelo. Voci justa, voci hachi harga vorke mes. Kes pesh kesh. Merash harkuma garibits hachi pochen arni. Et the sack adachka, as a Bohanes Bizenu Sharnakets is Chibu Hatsahe. Usten Mikich for threats, Chemchu Marabu Gernats. Shonazan. Of uh, portraits, one of them was I sort of hinted to him about 50 times that it's my favorite. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> Hopefully, I won't get too tongue tied with this. <laughs> I get caught up in it, so that's the first one then. Okay, do me on height, Banastertius, just a Chetes Navats Micheso Arans Hoski, yeah, yes, Tapum Ayatskner of Lusavo, yes, El Asenk Zaman Ali and Tetso and Baktavo Vorhartum 
et yerkel, eskan hecht, u eskan hol. So on to, on to the next one. On to the next one. He, he did call him, he's a reader of whoever created the nature, he loved the nature, so he thought he's lucky to read the world around him. And now my favorite, which makes me very sad though, always. Yeah. This one's more of a sad one. Yeah, it is, yeah. Okay. Gyanke Sari Raparak, Vodki Kohan Amenki. Chopan, chapan, chopan, ula, u, an patu, an tsav, a rants, a tiniki, in chikan tsarik, piti busna, vot chibusnav, es olin, in chipataschan, piti es tan, o tsarik tovolin. Sassun Sida with a part of his re reading of our Sassnatsare National Library. His uh, daughter Navarro was going to Russian school. She came home one day saying uh, that we're learning about all these Russian epics. Do we have our Armenians ones? And Tumanian being Tumanian, he said, Yeah, fine, I'll write one. And he, he wrote Sassun Sida with which language of which I just love you. If one of the works you read once and you remember by heart, it flows beautifully. It's very long, sadly, we cannot hear it all, but we're very lucky to have Noritza, who loves it, to read it in English. And it's the last very dramatic part when he's fighting, David and Mr. Amelik are fighting. Um, if you will permit me, I'd like to dedicate this to Osman Kavala. Um, great human rights activist, probably the most important one in Turkey, who founded the Anadolu Kultur and was in, in prison for two years without being charged. Um, he, he, was an extraordinary, he is an extraordinary man um, and he built bridges between people who don't speak to each other, he uh, published books, he's a friend of many of us here. And, it, and so suddenly the news came that he was going to be released yesterday. We were so thrilled and we were waiting for the news. He came out of prison, he was taken to a hospital, he was examined for two hours, he returned, and he was re-arrested. No. Yes, he was re-arrested, and this time he's being charged with being responsible or being part of the plot of the coup against Erdogan. So here is a man of courage who uses his pen as his sword. I just want to set the scene of storytelling. I went to Isfahan with my mother when I was a little girl, and we were walking through the streets, and we saw a beautiful cafe with a blue fountain in the middle, and men sitting around drinking tea and smoking. And I said to Mom, can we go in? And she said, no, so we went in. <laughs> <laughs> they gave us little cups of tea and suddenly this man walked in in a gown and there was a podium by the door and he stood there and he had a big staff and he stomped the staff and he started to recite most beautiful Persian poetry which we didn't understand but we understood it you know there was war, there was thunder, there was lightning bang 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 with the, with the staff it was absolutely amazing in the last 10 years, I went to Aleppo to see Derzor, and uh, I was in the bazaar walking, in fact I was walking with Ruth Keshishian, a friend of ours, and uh, we wandered into a seed shop since I'm a garden fanatic, and this man spoke a bit of English, and I said to him, do you have storytellers in the bazaar? And he said, how did you know? I'll take you. So he took us to a cafe. And it was big, and all the chairs and the tables were surrounding a dais with a big armchair made of wood, and uh, it all looked very important, and the seat was empty. Uh, and the storyteller came in. And he came in, and he climbed up, and he started reciting in Arabic this time. But he had a sword. 
And every time something dramatic happened, he went thump with his throat. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> Somehow the rumor got around that this stranger, strange woman, the only woman in, Ruth, in this place, is a writer and um, a storyteller. So he suddenly said, would you like to sit down? <laughs> and uh, the men started staggering. I stood up. And they were all kind of winking at each other. And he said, tell us a story. So I said, I'll tell you a story if you give me your sword. <laughs> he relinquished his sword, and I sat down. Ye lav gan knets, Ms. Ramelik. Ir kuzin arav, hezav ir cin, kshets, knats, minch diar bekir. Ms. Ramelik arose. Came to his, he came to his feet. He took up his lance and mounted his horse and dashed off all the way to Diyarbakir and from that place yet again returned. 3,000 boulders was Melik drawing by the handle of his gigantic lance. <laughs> <laughs> he charged and struck a bow. At once the dust arose and the world's globe trembled strong. Yegav Zargetz Gorav Oshum Uyararats Yergri Kunta. From this single blow hath David died, as Ramelik told his myriad soldiers. But David, from beneath the cloud, called forth, Gentaniem, Ambi Davids, Mesramelik, yet I am among the quick. Well, from a short distance only I did charge. But you'll see now from where it is I come. Arose the mighty one, came to his feet, and sprang on his mount for a second time. Utsin heads up, Yergrotan kam, Yergrotan kam kushets hala. Clear to Aleppo he rode. On his way back from there, he left free the rains. Rains came, and hail, and a strong hurricane with its tremendous force shook the whole world. Minelari, Herton Inshasa, among the quick am I, shouted David, charge once again, it is still your turn. Well, from short distance only did I charge, Melik shouted, and sprang upon his mount. Yeratankam Hezavirtin, Kanat Minchev Hore Misra. The third time now that he mounted his horse, out and away he rode to Egypt's own soil, and from that distance, the lance in his hand, back he rode, charging full tilt on David. He charged on David and struck with all his strength, struck with a crushing and formidable blow. The dust went up as high as Sassoon steeps. So dense, it was the sun's face that stood beclouded. Yegav zargets, polor ruzhov, zaner zargav, heskayagan, hoshin yelav, sasmatavitz, pernet yerevan arekagan. For three nights and for three days the dust lay, like a cloud over the countryside. For three nights and for three days the rumors went forth that David Sassoon had died. When they had passed three days like the dust that stood cloud-like, David too did stand, yea, as the peak, the peak of Mount Kutpur, stood David, fog-shrouded, majestic. Oh, Melik, he roared, whose turn is it now? Melik Asaf, Omane Herta, proud soul of Melik 
was terror-stricken. Death's rumors now possessed his very heart. His haughty, puffed-up spirit was now let down. Melik strode forth and dug himself a deep well, Kanat's Horung Mihor Pores. He let himself down into the dark grot. He covered the opening with 40 skins and covered these again with 40 millstones. That lion-hearted son of the lion-hearted, an Arudzi Arudzvortin, David stood up from where he sat, grumbling. He mounted his stormy steed, made it career as aloft he held his gleaming lightning sword. Through forty hides of oxen did it pass, through forty millstones did it pass, clear through the loathsome monster did it cleave, cut it to his flesh seven feet deep. Gentaniem, Minelai, I am among the quick, strike once again. Melik roared from deep within the well. David heard and was much astonished at the blow he'd struck and his lightning sword. Melik, he said, Melik, asaf, taptur mikich. Melik, he said, move about a bit. And Melik made a stir within the well, <coughs> and right down the middle his body split. One section falling here, another section falling there. The Egyptian soldiers, when they viewed that sight, terror-stricken, their blood to water turned. David called, be none of you in fear, but listen yet to what I have to say. You are but tillers of the soil, farmers, benighted and denied, hungry, naked, with a thousand and one ills and pains, with a thousand and one troubles to boot. Why have you taken up the bow and arrow, spilled over onto far and alien plains? <laughs> know you not that we too have homes and hearts? We too have tender babes and the aged, Menkelunek, Manu, Uzeh. Return you by the paths that brought you here. Return to the native soil of Egypt. But if once again by might and in arms you should dare to march against these freeborn men, be the wells you dig be forty measures deep, be they covered with forty millstones. Against you will rise, just as today, David of Sassoon and his lightning sword. And at that time, only God will know who between us shall be the sorrier. We who rise to wage a battle great, or you who have made of us your enemy. special Sasnats are relevant one day to read the whole story because there are so many gems here and uh, it's very special this we were talking about earlier David being so fair and so peaceful with everyone sending everyone back to peace instead of waging war so we have one more poem who will, which will conclude our poetry reading which is based on an old legend of Ahtamar of Baal Ahtamar Kutsi. So, shall we start? Dita Vahid, Vanazori, Okrik Kuritz Arachnia, Zorne Madum, Kafta Kori, Amenkisher Midra. Havar Gazuts Pars, Baitar. Mi luis gam chumed ran, mi var paros nera hamar. Shemolori irjantam, 
the music is by the iconic Gomidas, and uh, this version has also been arranged by Artur Bobikian. It's a story of a little partridge flying through the trees and the adventures it comes across. Yeah. 